Uh, just as kind of a disclaimer, when I was doing this in person at the uh, Wings Theater here at the summit, um, somebody asked me uh, as I was leaving the building, so what travel agency do you work for? So I need to tell you, I don't work for a travel agency. I'm not endorsing anything. Uh, and, and it's probably fair to say, these are my impressions and, and these are my opinions. So, you know, you can go to a country and find that what I've said was <laughs> not, not true or at all. So just as long as you understand. Um, so starting with Australia, this is a country that I've been to twice and each time, um, they were, they were pleasure trips, so they weren't business trips at all. And I was there about two weeks each time, so about four weeks all together. Oh. Um, the first thing I should probably say about Australia is, if you're leaving from Dallas, uh, both times I left from Chicago, it is a long flight. <laughs> and you usually go through LA, you can go through San Francisco. You, you rarely go east, you're, you're always going west. Uh, it's 17 and a half hours, so <laughs> if you, if you can afford first class, you'll love it. Uh, if you're cramped in, in, in the very back of the plane, and it's usually always a 747, although you know they're using the other larger planes too. But it's, it's a fair warning. Um, I know some people just can't be in an airplane more than eight hours, and this is about 17 and a half hours. And of course, you're gonna have a, a time change too. So the first thing I would say about Australia is, um, and I think this is an interesting thing, it is almost the identical size of the United States. So if you look at that picture of Australia and you flip it, um, that upper right hand corner becomes Florida. And, and the reason it's so interesting that it's the same size as, as Australia is that there are a lot of things in common. For instance, they have a frontier, which is going west as America did years ago. They have a native, uh, we had the Native Americans, they have the Aborigines, they had a gold rush. I forget what year it was. It was around 1850 or something, which was close to our age. So there's tremendous similarities just in the geography. Now, the big difference obviously is uh, they are far south. Um, and so it's gonna be a more um, humid and a warmer climate. It's, it's tropical, quite obviously tropical. And you don't see this on this map, but there are many, many islands to visit, which, uh, uh, my wife and I did, and, and those are really worth it. So this is the, um, the flag of Australia. You might notice a similarity to the Union Jack of England, and that is because it still doesn't belong to England, but it's still considered part of the Commonwealth. So you will find uh, Queen Elizabeth's picture uh, all over and on coinage, um, and I can't really explain it, but there is still that association. It's its own country. Um, but clearly still associated. Now, if you look at this map, which has the names of the countries, and most all of my travel was from the bottom where it says Victoria, Melbourne, and then we hugged the Eastern coast, which actually at a certain point is called the Gold Coast. I don't know if you can see that. Do you see where it says Brisbane? That's where the Gold Coast starts. Um, there are so many beaches. There are 10,000 beaches. <laughs> now they're on the other side too, but most, if you're going as a tourist, um, it's not that you can't travel. If you look in the middle, you see where it says Alice Springs, and then it says Ayers Rock. Ayers Rock is a very famous place. People visit it. It's got this, and I haven't been there, it has this very big pink rock, which if you like to backpack or camp, that's the place to go. Um, but that's about it. If, if you don't like nature, then you're going to stay on the east side of, uh, of Australia, because that's kind of where all the civilization is. Um, so going up, you've got Sydney, that's the capital. Um, and then you'll see many islands. So what, so what we did is uh, I rented a car and we drove from Brisbane all the way up to Cairns, which is the far north uh, east tip. But then one time we took a train and that was wonderful. If you can fly, it saves a lot of time, but you're not gonna see anything, obviously flying. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're gonna be looking at. The Great Barrier Reef, by the way, you see where it says Coral Sea, Great Barrier Reef. Um, that is just one of the most beautiful places in the world, which is threatened because of climate change. And well, you know, I don't want to get political here, but it, it is it is a beautiful thing to see, but a lot of it is, uh, is dying. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of who lives there, well, 36% uh, of the people are from England. And then you have people who are indigenous to Australia. 
but you've got people who visit from Ireland, Scotland, who live there, uh, China. And the thing that we found so interesting is when we were at a hotel, the bed and breakfast, um, we're going to talk about language in a moment. Um, what we would always see for breakfast was sushi. Do you have any idea why? Because uh, most of the tourists were from Japan. Now, if you look at the bigger map, and I don't have a bigger map for you, <clears throat> above Australia is you, you're going to have uh, eventually uh, Japan in North Korea, South Korea. So the tourist population is mostly coming in from Japan. So it's not out of the ordinary to see sushi for breakfast. You can get other things too. So here is some of the words that they use. You know, you, you've seen films maybe like Crocodile uh, Dundee. And there are words they use, which are their own words. Uh, everybody knows the Outback Steakhouse. <laughs> You've probably eaten there. Um, probably not identical to the food you're going to get in Australia. But I thought we'd have a little fun. So um, here's just a couple of words at random. Uh, maybe you've heard ankle biter. And I'm going to translate these for you. Uh, Barbie is not a doll. Uh, Bilbong. Uh, let me see. Go down. Lollies. The, that is the same word they use in England but I'll translate it in a moment for you. The Outback, you can probably guess, Outback is like the frontier, like we would say the West. They go to the right column. You might guess what a Rue is or a Joey, uh, but if you've never heard the words uh, anymore, you can, you can do fine as a tourist without knowing these words, but you're gonna hear the words. And so um, Garbo at the bottom right is not the movie actress from the silent movie era. <laughs> so let me translate these for you. So. An ankle biter is a child. That's kind of funny. Barbie is barbecue. Um, let's see, going down. If you're if you're looking for um, like runners or uh, sneakers, uh, Outback is the interior. But again, that's the West. Now on the right side, a roo is a kangaroo. That's short for kangaroo. And a joey is the name for a baby kangaroo. And by the way, kangaroos are only found in Australia. Nowhere else. If now, if you find a kangaroo in America, it's in a zoo. If you find a kangaroo in New Zealand, they've imported it. But kangaroos are totally indigenous to Australia. Um, I thought this one is interesting. A sparky is an electrician, which I think is funny. Um, a chippy is a carpenter. Um, and a garbo is not a silent movie actress. It's a garbage collector. So I thought you'd have a little fun with that. So here are the ones that probably, if you go over there, you will hear from people. The hotel concierge will say these to you. A taxi driver will say them. Um, so a mate, um, you may guess what that is, but you'll hear that they'll call you that. A uh, good day is, you know, is like good day or good morning. Uh, gnarly will and shark biscuit is, is really very cynical. So let me translate these for you. So if they call you mate, that's good. That's you're their friend. Good day just means hello. Uh, they'll say gnarly, which means awesome. Uh, recently I've been communicating with people in England. And now I'm starting to pick up certain words. So I'm ending everything with cheers. Um, a shark biscuit is a surfer. <laughs> that one is kind of funny because you do not want to be a biscuit for a shark. And there are still a lot of shark attacks. Um, but they, they have fair warnings. Their uh, lifeguards are very, very good. And they will put up, war if they see any sharks in the area and they're there, uh, they will let you know and they'll even, even close the beach. So a little bit of quick history. Um, the Dutch were the first people to explore it. The British were the first people to claim it. But the most interesting thing is in Sydney, in the port, you'll see a sculpture of a man in chains because in 1783, Australia started as a penal colony. So uh, when England ran out of prison space, they started sending their prisoners there. It was certainly like exile. Um, that they had no way of getting back home. And I, yeah, I was right. It was about 1850s was our famous gold rush, which again is uh, the pattern uh, that we had here in America. So it, here's a trick question. You don't have to answer it. Is Australia a country? Is it a continent or is it an island? Now, I don't know if anybody wants to make a guess on this. If you know geography, you know the answer. The answer is that it's all three. It is, uh, Australia is its own continent. Australia is obviously an island, totally surrounded by water, and it's a country. So it's all three. It's the smallest of the seven continents. It's one of the largest countries by area. And the continents from largest to smallest are the largest is Asia. Then you have Africa, North America, South America, Antarctica, Europe, and then Australia, just for your 
a couple of interesting facts. You have 1,200 miles of coral reef, and the best way to see them is to snorkel. You can scuba. You have to be very careful, though. If you know anything about coral reef, it's very jagged. And uh, if you were to get too close, you would easily um, scratch your arms or your legs or your chest. Um, it's very, very sharp. So I preferred snorkeling, which is you're kind of surfing. You're, you're at the surface looking down and you get an underwater camera. It's just wonderful. Uh, and if you know what you're doing as a scuba, then you, you can scuba. And they offer plenty and plenty of tuber, uh, tours and they take little boats out and then you just go from, from the uh, boat. Uh, let's see, their tallest mountain is about 7,300. That's not extremely tall, by the way. If you know, Pikes Peak is 14,800, I think. Um, and then it, it, its population is not great. I mean, it's about 25 million. So it's, uh, and mostly that population is on the right. It's a constitutional monarchy. I won't go into that. Became a commonwealth in 1901, which really meant England was kind of releasing them to have their own government. And, and I said that wrong. Sydney is not the capital. Canberra is the capital. Sydney is the largest city. And, uh, you know, it's a very urban city, uh, like so many cities. So what do you imagine when you think of Australia? Well, obviously, you think of the kangaroo. And by the way, we, uh, my wife and I went to a park where you go in with the kangaroos. Really wonderful. I mean, you could pet them. Uh, they were very gentle, but be careful because when they rev up on their tail, they have a massive tail. When they rev back, um, they don't punch you. They can punch you with their front paws, but they hit you with their back and uh, you will go unconscious. <laughs> so don't, don't upset a kangaroo. As, as, as gentle as they may look, they're extremely uh, powerful. So you may remember the film Crocodile Dundee, and I hope this doesn't depress you. It was many years ago, but uh, Paul Hogan, is now 82 and he doesn't quite look like he looked in, in the movies. Most of that movie was stereotypical. Um, you know, it was dramatized. I didn't see anybody going around opening the jaws of alligators and crocodiles. Um, Australians eat 260 million meat pies per year. I thought I'd jump into the food thing real quickly. Uh, meat pies really are from England. So a lot of the things you see in Australia, and if you've been to England, then you'll, you'll see the association. I mean, they have their own culture, but it's very, very tied uh, to um, Great Britain, especially England. They drink, drink 83 liters of beer. And you know what? I can't translate that for you. I don't know what a, I don't know how many liters there is in a can. Maybe one of you know that. But um, like on our train trip, we saw a lot of drunk people drinking beer <laughs> on the train. Um, they weren't rowdy, but um, that seems to be quite a, uh, quite a pastime. Uh, Mad Max, if you ever saw that film with Mel Gibson, that uh, took place in Australia, and I believe Mel Gibson is from Australia, one of the more famous actors. The, um, you know, you're probably going to buy a boomerang. We did. <clears throat> you know, uh, can, I, can I tell you, we've never used it. <laughs> you, you know, you, you have these tourist areas where, and that's Aborigine kind of art. It's very, very pretty. And, and a boomerang, which is designed to come back. By the way, they don't always come back. There's a certain way you have to throw it and a certain way you have to fling it with your wrist. And yes, it will come back, <clears throat> but it, it takes a little bit of practice to learn it. Uh, I guess I would suggest you'll be tempted to buy one and it could easily cost 40, 50 bucks. You put it on your wall, it'll look nice, but you won't be used. Uh, that's just my opinion. <laughs> you won't be using it. Um, uh, the Aborigine is the, um, you know, and they have cave drawings that go back 12,000 years. So we know that that's the indigenous people. And very much like America's Native Americans, because sadly, uh, a lot of them live on what we would call reservations. There's a lot of alcoholism, a lot of poverty. Um, and so even though they were the original people, <clears throat> it became the white settlers from England who really took over the country. Uh, but you can go and there are a lot of uh, pageants and uh, they will perform for you. I mean, that you won't really find tribes over there that are doing it. They're doing that for the tourists. And so you'll, you'll take a train and you'll go to a settlement and then they'll perform for you. And, um, you know, and it supports their, their own economy. But it's interesting to know uh, about their culture. The thing that I just love is the tropical rainforest. Uh, and you're going to find this in the upper northeast, which is around the area of Carnes. And it is truly just gorgeous. 
uh, let me tell you a mistake that I made. So my son was with me on our first trip. And at the time he was about 12. So it's my wife, my son, and we were following this guy. And she, it was a woman. And, uh, you know, she was wearing like a uh, cargo shorts and um, a pith helmet. And she looked, you know, very, very uh, 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 physical, very rugged. And like she would climb a rope for us and things like that. Well, we were following her in the tropical rainforest and, and we, we got lost. What happened was she kept moving ahead and we were looking at something. So my wife and my son and I, we heard her, but her voice was trailing off. And there was really no path. I think she knew where she was going. And I got to tell you, it is very scary to get lost in the tropical rainforest. You'll see in this picture, there's like a little bridge over there. But we started moving in circles. We couldn't find our way out. And finally, I made a good decision. You know what the decision was? To stay put and let her find us. <laughs> and she did. Um, but uh, yeah, if you, if you venture out by yourself, and we did do that several times, you won't always find a path and you won't always find signs. So, so you do have to be careful. Are there poisonous things? Yes, there are. One of the most poisonous snakes in the world is there. And then at the same time, you've got a desert. I, I never went to the desert, but this is the association with America. So you've got a tropical rainforest on the coast on the right, and then you go inland and you've got a desert, like it would be like us going to Arizona or maybe Nevada. Uh, so so uh, it, it's such a, a diverse country. I think that's part, part of what makes it look so beautiful. So the out best, I just had to throw this, I did not take this picture in Australia. Um, how close is it? I don't know. I, I never really asked from somebody from Australia if they ate at an Outback Steakhouse, if it was the same. Uh, yes, they do have, they do steaks and whatnot, um, but th that I can't tell you. What I can tell you is when you go to an Italian restaurant in America, it's Italian American, it's not really <laughs> Italian, Italian food. It's not like the food I grew up with. Um, okay, so this is one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture. That is the Sydney Opera House. And it's kind of on a peninsula. You can go over there. You get a tour. We took a tour. They take you through the whole building. Uh, one part's for opera. One part's for symphony. One part is for like public uh, concerts, pop, uh, rock, um, and renowned architecture. So it's in a bay. And uh, we actually were across the bay in a beautiful hotel. I think it was uh, uh, Hyatt. Um, and, oh, and this is uh, Ayers Rock that I mentioned before. It's this very famous, bright, red, pink rock. <clears throat> and that's kind of it. Uh, I mean, it's very hard to get to. I think you have to fly in, then you've got to take um, like a van, <clears throat> and then you can't camp. There's camping ground there. But, you know, if you like looking at a big pink rock, you can spend, <laughs> I guess, a week there. Once you've seen it, I, I, I've not been to the Grand Canyon, surprisingly, but people tell me it's wonderful, but it's not like you can look at it every day. So that's just to show it to you. Uh, the Aborigine people actually go back 65,000 years. And again, uh, th there are many places where th they really don't go around like this. They do it for the tourists. So there'll be places where they'll do a performance and they'll gladly take a selfie with you. Um, this is a, a Deuteri D, which is, uh, I may have mispronounced it. It's a piece of bamboo. And they have learned, um, I, I used to play wind instruments, so I used to play a trumpet. So I understand that you, you're buzzing your lip and you make this sound. It's pretty long. It has this really low, familiar sound. If you've ever heard music from the tropics, a lot of times it's called a deuteri D. And, um, and it's often painted. Um, and I think I bought one of those too. <laughs> and of course, obviously I've never used it. So I'm, I'm warning you that you'll be tempted to buy all these things, which the, of course that we gladly sell, sell to you. Now the beaches, <clears throat> if you like beaches and you don't have to swim, but let me tell you this. I don't know if you can tell by looking, you can walk really far out before there's any depth. And usually they'll tell you. And so the water is crystal clear. Uh, the skies are usually just beautifully blue and all these palm trees and the sand is this beautiful white sand. So if you go to Australia and you didn't go to a beach, you missed a big part of Australia. Um, like I say, you can walk out pretty far. You can rent a boat, you can take a boat, which we did. Um, and what we chose was uh, one time we went to a secluded beach and I'll tell you why I think that was a mistake uh, because, and I'll show you some pictures later. 
Uh, there are poisonous things like stingrays. If you remember that uh, Steve Irwin died when a stingray, uh, kind of accidentally, the, the tail hit him in the chest and went right to his heart and he died. And usually, I mean, you don't have tourists dying from stingrays. <clears throat> but I, here's the mistake I think we made. We went to a really, really secluded place. And if one of us had been stung or hit by something poisonous, there wasn't anybody to help us. <laughs> so, and, and this was kind of before cell phones. So um, you do probably want to stay near some population. It's not bad to have a lifeguard around. So if you want total privacy, you know, then you, you will, believe me, you will find isolated beaches. Australia has more than 10,000 beaches. So this is an interesting statistic. If you went to a new beach every day, it would take you 27 years. Now, obviously, a lot of those beaches look identical and they're pretty close to each other. If you love to surf, um, there's great surf. I, you know, by the time I got there, I was already in my uh, late, yeah, let me think, I was in my 40s, maybe 44 or 45, but I never did surf. So there's beautiful areas to surf. Uh, yes, there are sharks there, so you have to be careful, but they have competitions and you can just watch the surfers uh, and it's wonderful to watch. Uh, their big sports are, they do play football, but more because of their association with England, you're going to find more rugby and soccer and cricket, um, and then, of course, surfing. So those are kind of the big ones. I don't remember any baseball teams there. Um, their football is not like the NFL, for instance, um, and a lot of their games are pretty, pretty physical. I mean, they're not wearing a lot of protective uh, here. This is the actual hotel that my wife and I and my son stayed in. And I, I believe it was a Hyatt. And you walk along this pier and you could see the Sydney Opera House from there. Um, I remember it being a little expensive on my first trip, which was 1983. How did I know it was expensive? Aside from the bill, um, when I asked, I'm trying to think what it was. I needed some ice and the guy came with white gloves and the ice was on a silver tray. So you knew you were gonna pay for that. Uh, also, there was a, a remote device where you could open electronically the curtains, the shades, uh, everything in the room was electronic. Beautiful, beautiful hotel. So, you know, if you've got a little extra money and you wanna treat yourself for at least two or three days, uh, that was a, a wonderful, wonderful location. Here's the Sydney Opera House again. I don't know if I took a picture of the Harbor Bridge. The Harbor Bridge, and I hope I did, is one of the biggest bridges in the world. And that's the main bridge um, there in, uh, in Sydney. So, as I said, we did car and train. And this was uh, the train we took. It's not like the high-speed trains that you'll see in other countries, especially in Europe. The locomotive basically looked like a freight locomotive. But they did have accommodations where uh, they were very comfortable. And um, if you did an overnight, you know, it, uh, it would convert into a bed. But the thing I loved about it is, um, and here's an example of it converting in, in, into a bed, is we actually saw kangaroos jumping alongside the train. At that point, we weren't going terribly fast. And I think kangaroos can get up to maybe 30, maybe 40 miles an hour on a sprint. Uh, and it was just wonderful seeing the, once you get out of the city, um, you just don't see that by airplanes. So I love trains and I recommend trains in all my presentations because there are things you see from a train or driving that you are simply not going to see uh, by airplane. You, you find these pictures all over that they don't want you to hit the kangaroos. And, um, and if you're driving, uh, you will see these signs, which is a caution sign. It just means be careful for a kangaroo. Um, I, and I remember taking this picture. This was a little more volcanic. So this, this um, beach had a little more black stone than it did the pure white sand. But again, um, beautiful, beautiful um, uh, sunrises. You know, if you're on the east side, you're not gonna see a sunset, obviously, uh, unless you're further south and you're facing west. Um, and this is a, a picture that I got as well. Just. Gorgeous, gorgeous. You think Australia, think nature. Uh, so we did take a couple of boats that looked like this, which were great. Um, you know, you could you could be on the outside just looking. This is when we went to islands. We went to Hall Island and I'm forgetting the names of all of them, but staying on an island was really nice. Now, you didn't. what didn't you have? You didn't have a shopping center, obviously. 
sometimes you had at the least just a little uh, mini mark, a little store. And, and often those hotels were individual cabins, but I would really recommend that. Once you're in on the Gold Coast from Brisbane up, up on the coast, uh, go to an island and stay on the island for a couple of days, three, four days, if you want to relax. There's not a lot you're going to see, but uh, you'll enjoy nature. And again, these boats were really nice. Uh, so here's an example of one of the islands. Um, you know, yes, they'll, you can obviously have a, you'll, there'll be a beach, which is almost the whole island, and you'll have um, separate compounds, and, and, I, and this one, you know, had its own swimming pool as well. Um, and there are so many islands. I, I'm forgetting to count, but there's at least, off the Gold Coast, a hundred islands. Um, and they're, they're, they're sometimes privately owned, and so it's the same people that have the resort. It's usually a resort, not so much a hotel. Uh, this I refer to, I'm going to use a bad word here. Uh, this is the catamaran from hell. <laughs> I say that because this is, I do get seasick. And I was on a cruise about a year ago before COVID. It was a big ship. So I was perfectly fine. I, I had a, a scop scopolamine patch. I didn't even need it. But this catamaran was the most seasick I ever got in my life. And, um, even the, well, uh, let me tell you what happened. I mean, going out, uh, we were going out, uh, I think, to the Great Barrier Reef, and we were having fun, scuba and snorkeling. Well, coming back, the waves were against us. Now, if you know anything about a catamaran, it's hollow in the middle. Uh, it's not terribly large. But because we were going against the waves, every time we hit a wave, it was like a little bit like a roller coaster. You went up and down. Well, I seemed like I was okay for the first maybe 20 minutes, and they were playing a video. Well, this was my mistake. The video was of water, but not our water. They were showing scenes of Australia. Well, out the window with my peripheral vision, I could see the real water. Well, that water and the water on the screen weren't matching. And if you can guess what happened, I got deadly sick. Now, you probably know this. Once you get seasick on a boat, you can't get unseasick. Here's what I mean by that. Like at one point I locked myself in the bathroom. That doesn't help. The bathroom is still moving too. They finally put me in the captain's quarters laying on a couch as I was just terribly sick. And I remember, and, and by the way, it took forever. I mean, going, it, took, it seemed to take an hour to get to where we were going, but two to three hours to get back because the current was against us. And I won't belabor the story, but I remember the captain saying to one of his crew, Gee, I'd never seen a guy actually look green before. Now, <laughs> I don't think I was green, but I must have looked pretty bad for them to have said that. So that was the catamaran. It looks nice. It looks tranquil, but as and they can do it either under power or a sail. And um, so, um, you know, and if you have a great constitution, then don't worry about it. Try everything possible. If you do get seasick, a little bit of a warning there. Great Barrier Reef. Uh, a lot of the coral, the coral, of course, is deposits of dead animals over years and years and years. And then they become inhabited by fish. So you see beautiful tropical fish. And I had an underwater camera too. Um, and it's very close to the surface. So that's why I said, you don't have to scuba. You can snorkel and look down. And some of the, uh, the formations are literally only about five feet, uh, six feet uh, deep. So with a snorkel, which uh, we all did in the family, basically if you've never done a snorkel, it's really pretty simple. You just float it at the top. And even if your water goes under, usually the snorkel part seals so you don't inhale water. <clears throat> and it, it's just, a, and in the water, again, Great Barrier Reef, uh, really worth seeing. This is one of my cameras. It's an underwater camera. It's a normal camera inside a housing. And so I took a lot of pictures with that. Um, and again, you could see how very close uh, you are to the coral reef. Um, you see, I mean, this is a sea turtle, just gorgeous. Tropical fish are always brightly colored. Um, and this is the kind of thing you're typically going to see. And it's worth, really, you can spend a whole afternoon just looking at this. But, you know, if you go that far and you like to swim and you're not afraid of the water, then by all means, spend some time snorkeling in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, fish will come to you. Uh, most of them are not dangerous. I mean, obviously, a shark is. Uh, but I ran into something that scared me. It was called a gar. And a gar has a long snout with a lot, a lot of teeth. I wasn't expecting to see it. Um, and so it really, it really scared me. Uh, I don't know if they bite, but like I, like I was saying, we were on a secluded beach. And if one of us had got bitten, I don't know what would have happened. So probably good to stay around people. 
But um, again, this is one of the most fun parts of Australia. Now, this is actually not the actual one, but this is what killed Steve Irwin. You see that tail has a sting, a uh, poison at the end of it. And normally you can actually touch them and pet them. And I don't think, as I know the story, Steve Irwin was being aggressive, but for some reason the stingray thought he was, but that uh, tail at the end has a barb and it actually did go into his chest and it went into his heart. Um, so, you know, you, you, do, you do have to be cautious. The kangaroo, uh, yeah, can go 44 miles per hour. It's only found in Australia can hop 15 feet. And again, there are a lot of natural parks where you can go in and be with them, get great pictures. And really they're very, they're very docile. Um, you know, unless they find you threatening, they're, they're, they're not going to attack you at all. Be beautiful animal. I love looking at the li little babies. Now you'll find this interesting. Remember the baby's call it Joey. Uh, when it's born, it is the size of a grain of rice. Then it becomes about the size of a bee, pretty small and it climbs into the pouch. So it's born through the birth canal like most mammals, but then it climbs along the outside of the mother and goes into the pouch where it will live for about 18 months. Um, just just fascinating uh, part, of, part of nature. And I just love this picture. I mean, quite obviously the, the mothers love their, their, uh, their joeys, which is the little child very much. Um, but this is when you have to be careful when they rev up. Um, they can they can hit you with a boxing move, but it's the back leg, the back legs that will I mean they literally could could kill you. So if they rev up, I would start backing up personally. Um, the kookaburra bird. There's a lot of animals I just thought I'd show you that are unique. Uh, you you won't miss them if you're anywhere in the wild. They have a, la a loud laughing sound. They eat mice and snakes. And uh, we were eating at an outdoor, um, it was part of our hotel. We were eating outside and the kookaburra bird was up in the tree and it looked so pretty. And then suddenly it landed on our table and started stealing our food. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the wildlife still belongs to them. So you gotta be careful. Um, and I'm forgetting the names of some of these animals. I didn't uh, label them, but you will see animals there that you won't see anywhere else. This is a, a, a relative of a squirrel, but as you can see, it looks very different. In Australia, the koala bear. Okay, this is a famous bear. Um, they they say it's drunk, and and what I've read is it only eats eucalyptus leaves, and eucalyptus leaves somehow when they digest it become alcohol. So uh, they're kind of drunk, I guess. Uh, they sleep about twenty hours a day, but so does my cat at home. Uh, they weigh about ten pounds, and they live about eighteen years. They're not a domestic pet, so you know you won't be picking one up, and you won't be taking one home. Uh, but I guess you'd agree with me. They're kind of adorable and they do protect them. They do get hit by cars a lot, cars and trucks, because they're so slow. When they go across the highway, they often get hit. The dingo, very famous dog. It's a, it's a wild dog. And uh, if you remember, there was a famous movie years ago with Meryl Streep where they said the dingo abducted her baby. And I don't ever remember if that was true, if the dingo really did or not. But I, I would say it's close to our coyote. And when we, we moved to Dallas 21 years ago, and um, when we moved to Grand Prairie, parts of it hadn't been built up like it is now. And my wife said, oh, look at that beautiful skinny dog. And of course it wasn't, it was a coyote. And as you know, there are still coyotes all around Grand Prairie, Arlington. Um, and the more we build, the more we're taking away their territory. But the dingo for the most part is not dangerous to people. It'll steal things. If you're raising chickens, it'll eat your chickens, but but it is a very a very pretty. It's not it's not really a dog, but it's in the dog family. Then you have the Tasmanian Devil. If you ever watched Warner Brothers cartoons, you remember the Tasmanian Devil would spin around. It was like a crazy monster. It's really not a monster. I don't know how it got that word, but uh, like like many animals, they're nocturnal. So for the most part, if you go to Australia, you're not going to you'll see them in the zoo but you won't see them in person because they're usually sleeping. Most of them hunt at night. Then there's the wombat about, and again, we saw these, but we saw them in the nature centers, in the zoos, uh, because mostly they're nocturnal. Uh, they weigh about 70 pounds, they burrow, they do in fact bite. And then the, the tortoise, uh, this is a picture I took. Uh, normally tortoises are pretty quiet, but these ones were fighting over something. Um, a tortoise can live to be 150 years. And there's one documented at 226 years. 
uh, obviously their metabolism goes very slow and um, they, they can weigh 475 pounds, they have a very small brain. So we, we don't consider the tortoise extremely intelligent, um, but again, um, there are many, many in Australia. So here is a very, very pretty frog. We went to one um, hotel in Carnes where there was a double door and you went in an atrium. So there was wildlife in the atrium and then you'd go to your door. So the doors would open into the atrium. And so there were mostly birds and everything and some beautifully colored frogs. So here's one and here's another. Aren't they really pretty? Um, now, a word of caution here. Uh, they told us at the front desk, don't touch the colorful frogs. You're probably guessing why. The colorful frogs are poisonous and the poison's pretty bad. So you'll see them on a tree and you're tempted to want to maybe pick them up and certainly you shouldn't be bringing them home. But uh, I learned this over the years, the more colorful they are, I know if that's just God's way of warning us, the more poisonous they are. So you do have to uh, be, be careful there. Um, there are beautiful paths. Uh, there was one by a hotel. Every morning I'd get up and I'd walk this path. And one time I saw a sign that kind of ruined uh, my ability to love it. Um, again, beautiful. so it said emus. They kick, they bite, they peck, they stab, keep away. This is an actual sign. Now, there is an emu commercial right now. You've probably seen it. I think it's Liberty Insurance. And he's like an assistant detective. You've seen that commercial, right? Um, maybe it's not Liberty Insurance, but you know, it's an insurance company and it's totally fake. And I'll tell you why, because real emus are extremely dangerous and they're not domesticated. So when you see the emu in the TV commercial, it's green screen, meaning he's not sitting in the car with that guy. Uh, in fact, uh, let me give you a little detail about emus. Emus, <laughs> if you came up on one and you're on a path, uh, I would run. I guess I'd start running because they're almost prehistoric. Um, they're, they're a little bit like in Jurassic Park. Um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of that, the raptor. Yeah, they're a little bit like modern day raptors. So here's the TV commercial. Yes, Liberty Mutual. Um, no, what they did was they superimposed this. This is not the man's assistant. And, it, and I don't think emus like wearing shirts and ties or sunglasses. So yeah, it has a handler and a, and a you know, somebody, but uh, no, he wasn't sitting in the car with the guy because it would be rather dangerous. So if you take a look at this, this is actually how they fill the commercial. That's a green screen in the back, which means they can superimpose anything they want. You'll notice there's a chain and there's a handler wearing gloves. It's a dangerous animal. So commercials are cute, but that's not what emus are really all about. Emus, uh, you'll see them in a zoo here. And so consider this, uh, why did I say they're like a raptor? Uh, they can be six foot high, 150 pounds. They can sprint at 40 miles per hour, which I think they can catch up with you. They have strong clawed feet and they can rip a metal fence down. So that is why there's a warning. Uh, I took this picture. It looks like he had a perm recently. Uh, and I compare him to a raptor because these are actual feet of an emu. So uh, they can obviously do some damage. They're not, they're not, <laughs> yeah, it's a real emu. They're not a friendly animal. Uh, this is one uh, chasing somebody, another one chasing people. Um, so yeah, this was done with um, uh, photo techniques. So don't believe the commercial. <laughs> they're not a pleasant animal. So this is uh, one of the things they love doing over there is uh, bungee jumping. And this was one of the high, high towers about 500 feet. And I don't like height. I don't know if you do. Now, they'll let you go up in the tower just to look. You don't have to bungee jump. If you want to bungee jump, you can. Uh, a friend of mine once said who bungee jumped, why would I pay somebody else to um, give me black and blue ankles? Um, so my wife walked to the top of this tower. She's not afraid of heights. I Believe me, I would not go. And uh, she didn't bungee jump. She just went up there to take a look. So what they do, of course, is they put this cord around your ankles and, uh, and um, around your uh, midsection groin. And uh, it's a bungee. It's like an elastic cord. Um, and you're just going to jump off of the tower. Now, if you were a paratrooper in the military, probably not so bad. A lot of people do it for thrill. I think once you get to a certain age, and I shouldn't you know, say it that way, but I don't know that bungee jumping is for seniors. I mean... It, you know, go for it if that's something you'd like. The average jump is 500 feet. Uh, let me tell you what 500 feet is. Uh, that's the Washington Monument. 
the, uh, the Washington Monument is 550 feet. So just to get an idea, uh, I, I, I stayed at the bottom and I did watch people jumping and they had water and which really scared me because the top of the head hit the water. And if you know anything about like an airplane crash, if you hit the water, it's like hitting a wall. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, here's an example of somebody kind of hitting the water, not really great. This is the actual Washington Monument. If you've been to DC, you've seen it. That's the length of the average bungee jump in Australia. And sometimes they do it from towers. Sometimes they do it from uh, cranes they put up. But for me, that's eh, a little too high. Um, what is the leading cause of bungee jump deaths? Well, for me, it would be the shock before I would jump. <laughs> I guess my heart would stop. Uh, but there is, there are a lot of bungee deaths per year. And uh, I'll give you a couple seconds to see if you think you can guess. What's the leading cause of a bungee jump death? Th this one is probably gonna really shock you. It's a cord that is too long. Now think about that for a moment. Obviously, if you're going to jump, you want there to be spring in the cord and they have to calculate the cord and your weight, obviously, there's a big difference between somebody who's jumping at 150 pounds and somebody who's jumping at 300 pounds. And people have jumped and the cord is too long, which means you're going to hit the ground or, or the water. Um, and, and it has killed many a person. So I'm off the bungee jumping now. There's one tra train that goes to Corunda, uh, K-U-N-D-A, and at the end of it, where Aborigines doing a show, it's worth it. It really is worth it. Uh, I forget what city that's out of. I think it's near Carnes. It's the upper Gold Coast. But it's a very slow moving uh, train and you go uh, over beautiful waterfalls. See, here's a great example. I didn't take this picture because I hadn't been outside the train, but um, pretty sturdy. I mean, the, the bridges are trustworthy, but uh, it's a great way to see uh, by, by train. Um, this area. Then, and we did this too. You can go in an amphibious uh, vehicle and it'll take you on the rivers, especially in the rainforest. And yes, you will see a cro I think I said alligator before, there's no alligators. It's a crocodile. Um, and they can go to 75 years, seven feet long, and they are about 2,000 pounds. They look like they're sleeping all the time, but believe me, if you get in the water, um, it could be a very bad experience. So stay in your boat, make sure you don't stand while you're on the boat, but you will. You will in fact see many crocodiles. Sometimes you'll only see their eyes because they're kind of, you know, laying down. Uh, just an interesting fact, they have 80 teeth that are in their lifetime is replaced 50 times. Uh, but if you want to take pictures of waterfalls, we, one time we took the car and there was a name for a path. We took the path. We couldn't hear the waterfall and suddenly it opened on this gorgeous waterfall. Nobody else was around. It was just the three of us and uh, it was well worth the stop. It really was. Um, so again, nature is pretty much synonymous with Australia. So I wanted to conclude today with two things, flowers, which I always love taking pictures of flowers and I'm gonna finish with food. So um, here's just some of the flowers that I found in Australia. Now remember it's tropical and you also have tropical rainforest. So if you like flowers, uh, you're gonna see some just beautiful flowers. I took all these pictures myself. And this was, a, a, this was in the courtyard of a hotel. It's a lily, but I came back at noon, then I came back at three, and then I came back at six. And each time the lily looked different. And so, uh, and uh, I'm a photographer. So one of the things to remember when you take photos is come back at different times of the day and things will look different. Isn't this, isn't this a gorgeous uh, flower? And th this is a strictly um, an Australian. I, I really don't have the names for them, but you know, every hotel, every park, you, you'll just see beautiful, beautiful species of fly. And you'll see things that you absolutely won't see here unless it's flown in, unless it's flown in or, or imported. And this I think is a bird of paradise, um, which we do have here. And I don't think we have this here. And again, just, uh, you know, I, I spent like one whole day just taking pictures of flowers. Now, food, I, I said I would end on food. Now, remember, uh, Australia is called down under because it's far south, so it's tropical. So if you like fruit, and uh, my uh, one of my doctors said I have to watch my potassium, uh, <laughs> which didn't go over really big, which meant cut back on some of your fruit like bananas. But uh, if you take a look, 
Um, the Kiwi is, um, we have Kiwi here, of course, but um, that is very familiar. You're not gonna have a meal in any restaurant that you're not gonna see uh, fruit. So a lot of the fruit is here too. You know, we obviously have watermelons and we have um, uh, cherries, but um, they have some things that are only there like passion fruit and they have a lot of, we have mangoes here too as well. Uh, but uh, just these wonderful, beautiful fruit dishes. And again, um, if you're at a hotel where the breakfast is included, then you're gonna find fruit and sushi, <laughs> as I said before. Um, what you're gonna find is a lot of the beverages are really going to be fruit drinks. So tr uh, tropical ciders, uh, you could have it with or without alcohol, but it can be passion fruit, it can be pineapple. Uh, and you know you can obviously get bottled water there too, but you're in a tropical area, so you're, you're gonna get a lot of things that are with uh, fruit. Seafood, of course you're gonna have a lot of seafood. So here's the sushi on the right. And, and I like sushi. Um, but, you know, I wasn't used to having it for breakfast. And then if you look on the left, because you're on the water, you're on water everywhere. You're going to find calamari, which is those rings. You're going to find clams and oysters, and you're going to find crawfish and also lobster, lobster tail. So if you like seafood, um, you're, you're going to get a lot of it. Now, you may recognize what this is, and you're thinking we're in England, but this is fish and chips. The bottom is battered fish, usually with a beer batter. And you put a little lemon juice, it's over fries, which in, in uh, England they call chips. And then what's breaded at the top, those are calamari. So you know what calamari is, it's the seafood and those are rings, it's all fried. Well, you'll find this in Australia. You'll find it in London too. It's because of the influence of England on Australia that you're gonna find fish and chips. And that's what it's called. Now, here's the big one. I gave you that stat uh, earlier, meat pies. Um, which is very big in England. I mean, it goes back in, in London at least 200 years. So it could be lamb, it could be beef, it could be chicken. Uh, and then they make it in a pastry crust and they cook it and it's called a meat pie. Very, very big in Australia. You'll just find them everywhere. So if you're a vegetarian, then you're out of luck because <laughs> mostly the content in fact is, is meat. Okay, then we come back to the word Barbie. Yes, they do have ribs over there and they do have beef. Mostly the meat would be cattle and you would have, um, uh, you'd have lamb for sure. Um, you know, when I did my Russian presentation, I mentioned that sometimes it was a horse meat and dog. Um, they don't do that in Australia. Uh, as far as I know, the meat is usually uh, controlled through a packing house. Uh, but yes, they do barbecue a lot. So when they use the word Barbie and, and if you go to the Outback Steakhouse, yes, they do like barbecuing, but they usually do it over wood. They don't use what we would call the charcoal briquettes. Uh, they'll use natural wood, which depending on the wood will add to the flavor. You know, here in Texas, we use mesquite. Uh, so different kinds of wood are gonna give different flavors to the meat. But if you're over there and you like meat, then you should certainly, uh, and here's my last one. Um, there is something called Vegemite, which is original to Australia. And you know the way we put peanut butter on toast? They put this on everything. It is, um, here is the origin of it. They, they do a lot of beer and they didn't know what to do with the leftover brewer's yeast. So they decided to mix it with malt and a salt and it became this substance called Vegemite. I don't like it. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that. Now you may go over there and you may love it. Um, they say you have to acquire a taste for it. I mean, I didn't have to acquire a taste for peanut butter. I mean, I started eating peanut butter when I was a kid. Um, there are, you know, things in different countries that, you know, I, I would say when you travel, try everything, you know, it's worth trying. Uh, you may for well like it. You know, you can see it says craft on the label. So craft over there, but, but it's, but it really is, um, kind of indigenous. They invented it, uh, what, 1923? Um, and, and I tried it a couple of times and each time I did not like it. Uh, but that's their, that's their big product. So we have ended here. And uh, again, I wanna thank you for joining us. I, anyway, do we, uh, is anybody still with us to ask any questions or comments? But thank you, Don. You brought back a lot of memories. I recognize your voice, Lily. Hi. I love Australia. Well, thank, thank you for joining us. I enjoyed it. David and Charlie, thank you for joining us. And I don't know if Kevin is still with us. Um, 
it was great to have you with us today. Thank you. And so uh, join us again, okay? <laughs>